No. From Hortonworks, he will give you an introduction to Hadoop. Have fun. Thank you very much. So, as I mentioned, I'm uh, Olivier Renault. I work as a solution engineer for Hortonworks. Uh, I've joined Hortonworks at the beginning of this year. I'm myself still a bit discovering Hadoop, so bear with me. That's why we're doing only an intro. Maybe next year we do something a bit more advanced, but here we go. So before I jump into uh, Adobe quickly, I'm just going to quickly present with Alton Works. And to present where it, where it, with Alton Works, what we like to do is to look a bit at the history of Adobe. So Adobe got created in uh, 2005 in uh, Yahoo, okay, based upon a white paper which was written on, by Google about how to process a large amount of data in parallel, okay. So it was created by a, a guy and his team, the guy's name, Eric Baldeschwiller, and uh, we know him more, most often under the name of E14, because Baldeschwiller has got 14 letters, effectively. And uh, they started in 2005, they released it as an open source project in the Apache Software Foundation in 2006. And pretty much, uh, they've developed this project along with Yahoo, along inside Yahoo. In, uh, from 2006, it got picked up by other companies, such as Facebook, such as uh, Twitter, and so on and so forth, and it gets started to have some growth outside just, the, just Yahoo. And pretty much in 2008, they looked at uh, their growth of uh, Hadoop, and so in 2008, they were reaching a number of clusters which were around 20 nodes, 30 nodes. And they looked and they're starting to see that within Yahoo, the usage for Hadoop was starting to grow and grow and grow even further. And it was going to grow to a large scale, so they started to focus on how to operate a cluster at scale. Just so, so you know, right now, uh, the amount of Hadoop node within Yahoo is around 75,000, okay? The, a cluster for Yahoo is 4,000 nodes on Hadoop 1.0, and they're starting to run Hadoop 2.0 on a cluster is 15,000 nodes right now for them. Okay, so when you start to having this kind of scale, you need to think about how you're going to operate and how you're going to manage it at this kind of volume. In 2011, uh, yeah, Hadoop got used even further and the, start, the world of the enterprise started to get interested with, uh, in Hadoop. And so Autonworks got created at this time and it's pretty much, so Eric Baldeschwiller, which was at the beginning, which left, plus 24 is a key Hadoop engineer, and created Hortonworks. Okay, the focus is to arrive into stability and provide enterprise distribution effectively. So Hortonworks got, we do three things. We still develop quite extensively. We distribute and we, what, that's, what we, that's what we provide. We provide an Hadoop distribution, which we call HDP, Hortonworks Data Platform. And after that, we support. We work with few partners. Uh, one of them is a, a customer of ours and is, is still is Yahoo, but it's also a, a a partner for us, so it's also developing partners. So we work with them along the, with, on the features and on the roadmap, and they also give us access to their cluster in order to do our QA testing. Okay, so before we launch a uh, distribution, we've got the opportunity to test our distribution on the 4,000 node cluster of Yahoo. So when we say that we test our distribution at scale, we actually do test it at fairly large scale. We've got also a, a company which is well famous for this love open, of open source, Microsoft, uh, that's also one of our partners. Uh, it's kind of strange to see Microsoft coming into, uh, into the picture, but Microsoft tried to bring Hadoop for, we were, for a year and a half, they tried to port Hadoop onto, on top of Windows, Hadoop being just Java, you know, uh, write it once and run it everywhere. It should have just worked. Uh, they struggled and they came to us for, us for some help. What's interesting is that now Microsoft is also uh, providing quite a lot of input on how to optimize some of the work which has been done. So they are trying to arrive to the table and they're trying to arrive to as a community as well. We then have Teradata and Rackspace in the cloud. Then uh, the way of seeing why Autonworks is contributing quite a lot of the Hadoop project is that the green bar, that's the amount of uh, line of code that we've contributed to the project. So yes, we are heavy developer on this project. The second, the second contributor is Yahoo. So when I was saying that Yahoo is still a development partner for us, that's uh, Autonworks, Yahoo, and then the third player, which is Clarira. Okay, so we, we, we're quite heavy on this part. As part of uh, HDP, what do you get? But you get, obviously, Hadoop, and Hadoop, it's made of a distributed file system, HDFS, and a parallel processing engine, which is called MapReduce, okay? So that's what we call the Hadoop core. 
You've got now also something which is called Web HDFS, which is a REST API in order to bring your data onto the HDFS file system. And with Hadoop 2, what we're all waiting for is something called Yarn, yet another resource negotiator. And the beauty of Yarn is that it's going to take away from just being a MapReduce solution. We are going to be able to do multiple other applications on top of that. So I don't know if you've heard from Storm, from Twitter, which is a streaming engine, effectively. With Yarn, we will be able to run a MapReduce, and on the same cluster, run a Storm cluster. Okay, so that's going to be fairly interesting. Then we provide, uh, as you probably know, the name node in Hadoop 1.0 is a single point of failure. So as part of our solution, we also provide uh, an HA solution for the name node. We've got disaster recovery, snapshot, mirroring, and so on and so forth. What we do is that <coughs> everything we do is actually on the 100% open source. So everything we do, we give it back to the community. Okay, so it's not something which is it's developed by us but then it's available for everyone else. So that's pretty good. You can go and download it directly from the website, okay? So there's a lot of data services around uh, on top of Hadoop because uh, MapReduce is initially some written in Java, okay? So you need to write your, your MapReduce in Java most of the time. I don't know about your Java skill, but mine are equivalent to none. So thank God for that, there is some other option which are available and two which jump to mind are Pig and Hive, and we will speak about Pig and Hive in a bit. Of, in a bit. There is also HBase, which is available, which is an OSQL database, okay? And Flume and Scoop. Flume is when you want to stream some log file into HDFS, and Scoop is to be able to export some data from a standard RDBMS database into Hadoop and ex uh, export from Hadoop into another RDBMS database. Then we've got some operational services, and that's on Barry and Uzi, so I will do a demonstration of on Barry a bit later. And Uzi is a scheduling engine. See it as a cron job if you want. You can schedule all of your pig and I job and your MapReduce job to happen in a certain manner. So when the, the data arrive in HDFS, you can just take some action based upon Uzi effectively. And all of that is what is HDP. Run on top of Linux, run on top of Microsoft as well. That's uh, part of another. We run in the cloud, in the VM, or as an appliance, okay? And in terms of uh, marketing blobs, that's finished, all right? So, uh, quickly, an overview of Hadoop. So, of Hadoop. So, first, it all started at Google, okay? So, uh, Google needed a way of doing page ranking. So, they wanted to see all of the links and how the links are going in between the different web pages in order to, when we do a search, provide us with something which is relevant to our search effectively, all right? Um, a way of looking at it is to, that's pretty much uh, the idea of map, so Google wrote this white paper called MapReduce Simplified Data Processing on Large Cluster. They put it out, and pretty much that's the idea. So you've got two faces, you first mapping, and then you're reducing it. So if you look with an example, we've got, uh, we're going to look, look for all of the URL where there is a book, the word books, okay? So we are looking at this URL when we find the word books, we we linking all of the URL all together. So you've got books in this uh, URL and on that URL. And that's pretty much what the map, map, map reduce concept is all about, okay? Is to be able to do some key value kind of solution. The, with this kind of uh, work, what now people are able to do is, for example, to look at all of the web log which are being uh, generated when people are using your website. And based upon the information that of this web log, being able, for example, to do a recommendation engine. Okay, so you've all gone to Amazon, you've all bought from eBay or from whatever. And when you, choose, when you search for something, there will always be uh, some stuff that you search for, and then some other products which are fairly relevant to your search. An example is that, for example, uh, my dad is a fisherman, so I look for some t at some point to buy a rod for his birthday. And <clears throat> I didn't bought the fishing rod, so for a wee while, eBay was convinced I was really much into fishing and they were pushing me a lot of advertising about, you know, either the string for the, my fishing rod or the special boots to go fishing or whatever it was, you know. Fortunately, I was actually not really that much into fishing myself. But anyway, that's another story, okay? So, um, so the idea of uh, Hadoop is that, so you've got the map, you've got the shuffle phase, and then you've got the reuse. The shuffle phase is this phase where we are linking all of the books together. The beauty of this uh, MapReduce paradigm is that you can work 
into a lot of system at the same time. You can, it's parallel processing, effectively. Okay? So, Hadoop is made of two components initially, HDFS and MapReduce. So let's have a quick look at how the HDFS works, effectively. Well, that's a cluster, so we've got some nodes which are the master node on the, on the side, on the, that's the blue node, and then we've got a lot of data nodes which are in a rack, and Adobe's got this knowledge of rack awareness as well, so it will know where your nodes are located, and it will make sure that your blocks are not on the same physical box or within the same physical racks in order to uh, make sure that if your stuff crash, it doesn't work. So that's the HDFS part. So HDFS. It's, it's, uh, first, it's a distributed file system, so we don't have a SAN at the back end. We're using standard pizza box in order to have that. Some key assumption, hardware failure is a norm. Okay, so the file system itself is planning for hardware failure. It's made for high throughput, and it's an append-only file system. So it's something which is really good. Uh, you write it once, and you read it many times. And what, they're trying to, what we're trying to do with uh, HDFS and MapReduce is to have the computing power to be close to the data, okay? So that's one of the important parts of it. When you run an HDFS, you've got few components, and that's the f when you look at the, you've got first the name node, and the name node is effectively holding in memory all of the information of where your data is located. And when I say that, was a, that is a single point of failure, that's kind of an issue, because when you are losing a name node, your data wasn't lost, but you were not able to access it. Which, you know, if you feel like uh, some clusters that I know of where you've got five petabytes of data, suddenly you can't access your five petabytes, it's can be an issue. Then you've got another one which is called the data node, and the data node are effectively the worker node. Okay, so the one which where this, you store your data, and you go, it's where you're going to do your map reduce processing. They ping every so often the name node in order to make sure that to tell them that they're alive, and they will also report the blocks that they've got available on top of them. And then we've got a third node, which is called the secondary name node, and AIM is only making sure that the image of the name node, of the information of all of the blocks where, they locate, where are the block located, is correct. It's a really fairly bad name, because when I first started to work with Hadoop, I thought that the secondary name node was the failure of a name node, effectively, which is not. Okay? So don't get confused with the name. It's not uh, a failure of a name node. It's something else. So when we say that it's uh, something which replicates itself, but that's pretty much how it works. Okay? So when you want to copy a file, it goes first, the file goes first to, so when you, the client goes to the name node and says, okay, I want to copy this file to your HDFS. Right? So it, the name node says, sure, you're going to work with server A. So the client then sends the data to server A. And straight away say, okay, but we need also to replicate this block onto, typically it's a replication of free. You can change your replication as you want, but typically it's a replication of free. And it's going to then copy the block onto two other servers. Okay? And that's how it works. So if you lose one server, or if you, even if you lose two servers, the name node is going to detect that you've lost, that you've got a block which is under-replicated, and will make sure that it's copying this block to two other extra servers. Okay? If, for example, it's just that you've rebooted the node, it doesn't matter, you will have copied the block, and you will have the block four times. If you only want to have three, if you've decided that you want a copy only of three, the next time that it needs some space, it will get rid of one of your blocks which is over-replicated, if you want. Okay? Any question regarding the HDFS part? No? So then the second part is the MapReduce, okay? So MapReduce, it's a framework for developing a distributed application across large amount of data. And the idea is really to have uh, the processing to happen really close to uh, your data, okay? So as we've seen, the block is replicated on top of Freenode by default. So we will, when we're going to try to do a MapReduce action, we're going to send it to the, to the server, which got a copy of the data available with them. Okay? So we are trying to not have to copy the data across the network or anything like that. We're always going to try to send it where it goes. Same thing for the MapReduce. We've got few components. We've got a job tracker, and the job tracker is, going, is, uh, all, is the one who's going to decide which node is going to work and the task tracker, which is effectively going to do the job, okay? 
uh, the job tracker, so when you send a job, the job tracker go to the name node, say which block uh, we want to work on this type of, the, on this data, which servers do you have the blocks? And that's where it's going to then send it to the data or to the task, task tracker who's got the data, okay? That's pretty much uh, the map reduce phase, okay? So we've got first the mapper phase which happen, and we've got the shuffle, okay? And then after that, when you finish the shuffle, you do the reducer. Be careful, the shuffle phase, it's really network intensive. So because we've got rack awareness in, uh, in Hadoop, so you can say this cluster is in rack A and that cluster is in rack B, often for HA purposes, we're thinking, amazing, great, I'm going to put one rack in data center one, another rack in data center two, and I will get high availability by splitting my uh, two racks in two data centers. And it's kind of work until you get onto a large amount of data and you try to do the shuffle across the network and you're bringing down the pipe which is joining you to data center effectively. You're going to flood the pipe. So the advice for now is don't do it. Apparently they, f they are working on doing something in order to fix this kind of problem. Okay? That's pretty much what we've seen earlier, so I'm not going to go to that. We, so as I said earlier, MapReduce is something that you write in Java. Most of the time you can also write uh, an option to write it in Python, but it's most commonly done in Java. There is two other tools which have been developed, in, uh, Pig has been developed at Yahoo, and Hive has been developed at Facebook, in order to give something to the analysts who are not Java experts and still make sense of the data that they've got. Okay? So, Pig, it's a scripting language, okay? It provides something that they call the Pig Latin, and it's a data flow scripting language kind of thing. So, <clears throat> why use Pig? But, uh, so what do you say? Uh, you've got some file, you want to merge two different type of file and take the top five most visited website for, the eight, for a group of age, 18 to 25. If you do it in MapReduce, that's the amount of code that you need to write, okay? So as I say, what, 170 lines of code, four hours to write it. If it's me, it's probably five days, but you know. <laughs> I'm a Java coder with Google, so. In pig, it's, a, it's nine lines of code, okay? So what people tend to say is that you use, 75% of the time you use pig, and when you can't use pig, then you're going to go, go and move to something else. Pig also can be extended by some, uh, what we call the user-defined function, and this user-defined function can be in any languages. So they can be in Python, they can be in whatever you want to, okay? So it's really quite convenient to work with. So, uh, the idea behind Ping is that MapReduce was too low and SQL was too high. Well, SQL is fairly straightforward, but if you don't know, I guess it's maybe true. Okay, so the Pig Latin is here to, to go around this issue. Uh, <coughs> there is no need for a schema, you can do join, you can do sort, and you've got, as I mentioned, the SUDF. We tend to use Pig a lot when you want to do ETL, okay? So there's a lot of usage for Hadoop, where we store a lot of new data source. The data source could be uh, the web log, could be the email, could be text form from different uh, um, query or whatever. And we speak, we tend to do a lot of ETL of cleaning the data, merging it together, and maybe we're going to then export it back to so another RDBMS or to something else, okay? Pig is make of three things. So we've got the Pig Latin, which is uh, the language. You've got a shell, which is called Grunt, I know, the IT people, they like to have fun. It's, a, it's big, it's grunt and everything, it's normal. And then we've got what we call the piggy bank, which is a way for sharing uh, UDF, okay? So there is quite a lot of UDF which have been defined and that you can go directly and basically use them directly out of the piggy bank, okay? Do you have any question regarding pig? No, it's all clear with pig? So we've got this friend, which is called Ive, okay? And uh, Ive is pretty much an SQL-like interface, okay? So it's, the idea was to become an enterprise at our house of, uh, of Hadoop. I'm not sure we'll get there with, uh, with Ive, but that's pretty much the idea. It's going to be an SQL-like interface that you can use. So it's called IveQL. It's based on SQL 92 specification. It's not ANSI SQL, but it's getting there. Uh, it's pretty much like a relational database. So you're going to be able to do, you know, a select, star, from, blah, blah, blah. 
joined by and everything. Okay, but here we go. Here's a different typical, I mean, if you're a bit familiar with SQL, you will probably recognize some standard statement because there is nothing new there, effectively. Okay? So, something which is interesting is that in most organizations, you're probably going to use pig and you're going to also use hive. It's not either one or the other. It's something that you can use together in parallel. Okay? So, uh, I use a good choice when you want to query this data, and especially if you're already familiar with SQL. Pig is, is, as I was saying earlier, is pretty much good for doing a lot of ETL. OK? I'm just realizing that I'm going quite fast on my presentation, so I'm just going to go back quickly, and I'm going to speak about some few small. So uh, then we've got something which we call H catalog. And as Pig and I can be used exactly in the same organization, we uh, got a way of having the same metadata shared across pig and hive user because by definition when you copy data into Hadoop it's schemaless okay it's on some unstructured data that you put into Hadoop and it's schemaless so sometime when you were having when you were working with pig you were defining your your field with a certain name and the hive user would may define them with another sort of name and the idea of this catalog is to provide a metadata directory where you store all of this information. So when you pig user is speaking to, uh, when you pig and hive, use exactly the same metadata information. So when you want to share information across two different teams using two different, uh, one or the other tool, at least you've got a way of having this information being shared easily. Okay? And then we've got also a uh, Fluman scoop that I mentioned earlier. So let's go back to the, something which is maybe more admin like which is Ambari, okay? So Ambari is a deployment mechanism which is used to deploy uh, Apache, uh, to deploy uh, autonomous data platform. It's an open source project. You can deploy Vanilla Apache as well with that. And the idea of, uh, of uh, uh, the ID behind Ambari is that you're going first to use it to install your cluster. Then you will be able to manage your cluster. And finally, you will be able to monitor your not your cluster, but also monitor your job on top of that. Okay, so it's also a way for you to push configuration across different uh, platform and modify your configuration from one single place. So of course you can do that all with uh, Puppet and Chef and on Seaball, and we've all heard about it for the last two days. But that's you know that's one of the way. Actually, underneath, on Barry is using Puppet in order to uh, to do that effectively. But that's another issue. Okay. The beauty of Ambari is that it's got also uh, a REST API, which means that if you've got another solution that you want to integrate with Ambari, you can do that through the REST API. By default, Ambari is coming with uh, a monitoring and a performance monitoring and also a monitoring uh, uh, solution embedded as part of it. And the two solutions that we're using is Ganglia and Nagios. Okay, so Ganglia and Nagios are installed by default by Ambari, effectively. If you want to use another performance monitoring solution, you mo it's really easy to actually get back the information out of the REST API. For example, we, uh, so as I mentioned, we've got partnership with Teradata and with Microsoft. And Teradata and Microsoft do have system management solution as well. And when they implement the system management solution, they don't change everything to uh, work with uh, Autonworks. What they do is actually they modify, they integrate through the Ambari interface. So they don't present Ambari to the end user, but they are getting all of the information out of Ambari, effectively. Okay? Ambari got created based upon the experience of the team at uh, Yahoo when they were using uh, Yahoo, uh, Hadoop at Yahoo. Basically, that's pretty much, uh, it used to be called Hadoop Yahoo Management Console or something like that. And that's a bit of a rewrite of what they used to have before. Okay? So just to show you that you don't really need to have a lot of skill in order to install a cluster. We're going to install one together. Voila. Uh, here we go. So uh, what I've done there is that I've installed an Ambari server. And installing an Ambari server is extremely complex. It consists of saying, yum install Ambari server. So that's kind of taking skill already. Uh, and then the next step is to say, Ambari server space setup. And you've got two stupid questions which are being asked. 
and both you can keep the default. One of them is, do you want to modify the default password for the database? You can choose yes or no. And the other one is, do you uh, accept the Oracle license for the JDK? Because it's going and downloaded the JDK, uh, the Sun JDK, sorry, the Oracle JDK, uh, out of the Oracle website, and you've got to press yes in order to validate it. Okay, so that's pretty much what I've just done in order to arrive to this page. I know then I did on Barry server start. Again, that's taking quite rocket science. Uh, then I've gone on to the the URL, log with the default credential. And I'm, right, I'm presented with this page, okay? So I'm being asked to give uh, a name of, for my cluster. I'm quite imaginative, so I'll just use the name of my company. Normally, I've got more imagination, but last night I kind of lost some funerals. I don't know what I did last night, but you know. Uh, then we are being asked for the list of hosts that I want to install uh, my cluster on, okay? So because I'm lazy, I've already created the list and I'm just going to do a copy and paste. So I've, here we go. So I've defined, uh, I've got few hosts there which I've written, okay? So I've given them some name which are making sense, like name node and shop tracker and so on and so forth. It doesn't matter, but here we go. All of my hosts got already a, an SSH key which is being provided. If you don't want to have a shared SSH key, that's fine, you take a bit more time, you need to first install the agent on top of each node in manually, so it's going to be a yum install on Barry agent. Again, it takes a bit of skill. Uh, but there, in my case, I've already shared uh, the SSH key because it's actually running on the cloud. So by default, I've got one which is, uh, just need to use the right one. Here we go, that's the wrong one. Here we go. Right. And uh, then <clears throat> I can, if I've got a local repository for my, uh, on, for my packages, for my autonomous packages, then I can select it here and define the uh, where it's located. And it's not my case. And if I want to have a custom place to install my JDK, again, I can modify it here. Not, uh, it's not my case again. Okay, so I'm just going to register and confirm. And it's going to go to every single node and make sure you can speak with it and start the Ambari agent on top of it. Okay? So bon, it's a demo, it's live, so normally it should break and we should have a big red failure at some point, but you know, let, let's cross finger for five minutes. Um, so I've even, as you can see, I've also embedded as part of it the uh, Ambari server itself as part of the cluster, okay? Because it's also going to be become part of the cluster. Luckily, it's saying that it's able to speak with all of the nodes. So then I'm being presented with a list of components Okay, uh, I'm being presented with a list of components that I may want to install, okay? So uh, I've got HDFS, I've got MapReduce, fair enough, I kind of need this too if I want to do some Hadoop stuff. Uh, then I can, as I mentioned, I've got Nagios and Ganglia which are available by default, and all of the DOFERN components are, are there, okay? I'm not going to uh, bother, I'm just going to press next, and that's pretty much it. Then it's going to suggest, based upon the amount of uh, servers that I'm going to install my uh, Hadoop cluster on, how, may I, how do I want to, um, to spread my services, okay? So there, I only have uh, seven hosts, apparently. So it's going to try to put as much as possible on three nodes. But if I add, let's say, 200 hosts, it will try to split much more the services in order to have something which is much more scalable in the future, okay? So it's got a bit of intelligence as part of it. The only intelligence it doesn't have is that, for example, it's chosen for, my, uh, for one of my servers, something which is called data node one, which is not exactly what I, I was hoping for. But anyway, it doesn't really matter. It's just a name. So then we press next, and it's asking me, where do I, do I want to have HDFS installed on all of the components, yes or no? And uh, as I've also said that I wanted to have a HBase install, it's suggesting to install a region server on every single data node. Whatever, I'm going to say next. Okay. I've got some issues with my mouse today. Ooh. Bon. Either is the mouse or it's the internet, but uh, one of the two is not too happy. 
There we go. Uh, voilà. So now I arrive to the, to the last spot, and I can review all of the different configuration files, and I can pass some additional information on top of it. So for example, there, I mean, uh, the HDFS configuration. We tend to have uh, a typical Hadoop server for data node. We'll have a lot of different disks. Those disks won't be ready because we're trying to spread the I.O. across all of the local disks at the same time because we've said that we were happy to lose a disk because HDFS is resilient by itself. So I don't need to have read, actually. By having all of the I.O. going on at the same in parallel to all of the disks, I'm going to have a better speed in order to uh, access my disk than by having a red device, effectively. Okay? So uh, if I had what, we, what will typically happen is that if I've got a lot of local disks, each disk, no, that's not on the name node actually, it will be uh, on the data node. There we go. Uh, each disk will be a, a specific mount point, and we will try to mount, we will uh, mention all of the mount points in this folder, for example. There, pretty much, if you're familiar with the HDFS site.xml, you, find, you can find uh, hdfsi.com. You can find all of the information uh, that you will f find, uh, that you find in the configuration file, available from the web interface. Okay. Um, here we go. That's, for example, for HDFS, and it's the same for exactly all of the uh, different options which are available into the into the solution. Okay. There is. As you can see, there is some red point there, and the red point just means that I've got some input which is expected from me before it's allowing me to go first. I'm going to stop here because there is no need for us to sit through an, sat through an installation of an Ambari server. It's going to go quickly. It's going to take 15 minutes you know, to install all of the packages and so on and so forth. One of the beauties is that when he finished to install before it starts the service, he's got what, they call, uh, what we call a smoke solution. And so before it starts HDFS, he's going to run a test to make sure that SDFS is working. No, he start SDFS, and after he started it, he ran a test to make sure that SDFS is working. Then we'll try to start MapReduce and do exactly the same. We'll launch a small test to make sure that MapReduce is working. The same with HBase, the same with Hive, the same with everything. Okay? So, I've got one which I'm already running there. Okay? So, that's, uh, but that's an Ambari server which is monitoring a cluster already, okay? So it's a 12 node cluster that we've got running in, uh, on the cloud, I believe, okay? And from here, I've got access to all of the different services which are available on top of my cloud, okay? So I can click on HDFS, for example, and it will tell me uh, what is my name node, what the, my second name node is, how much storage do I've got available, what is the current uh, memory usage for the, uh, for the HDFS part, effectively. So it can be, we're trying to provide you with some metrics which are relevant to you. So these metrics are actually stored in Ganglia, and we're just displaying them into, in the interface, okay? You can also, uh, from this space, each, uh, so the name nodes, the task tracker, the job trackers, they all have a standalone web, web user interface. And from here, you can go and do go directly onto the web user interface of the data node, for example, or the name node to see what's happening, okay? So I can do that for, uh, ooh, I don't know if okay. I can do that for uh, my HDFS, but I can also do it for my produce, for Ivan, for H catalog, okay? There is something else uh, which is interesting. We've got what we call a neat map, okay? And a neat map will quickly give you a, a view of how is your cluster doing. For, for example, there I can see that in this space, I've got no issue, everything is green, and it's all good. When I look at the memory usage, I can see that I've got some server which are slightly more used in terms of memory. So I can have a quick look at what's, up, what's running on this server and why is it busy and is it normal that it's so busy. Well, we can see that actually the server is running Ganglia, Nagios, the name node, so one of the most important components, okay? And it's all on one server. We should probably have spread it into multiple servers and we won't have this issue about memory, okay? But it's a quick, you know, imagine you've got now a really large cluster and you... When you look at the disk space, you've got one node which is saying, okay, actually I'm copying a lot of data to this node. It's a quick way of seeing that you may have an issue and you may want to change something or you've got a problem. Okay, so it's a good visualization tool, effectively. Then every single service can be uh, stop or start directly from here. Okay, so I can stop it, I can start it. 
Mm -hmm. I can put a node, mm -hmm. I can, because that's what I was mentioning earlier, we can run a smoke test so that to make sure that my HDFS solution is still working, it's still behaving in exactly the same fashion as I was expecting. Um, and so that's the different information of my HDFS. On the right hand side, we've got the Nagios alert. Okay, so if we had uh, an issue, na so it's some predefined uh, Nagios alert which are available there. And if we had an issue, it will be brought back here. As you can see, there is never an issue with uh, Autonworks. It's all green, amazing. And then we've got, again, some of the metrics which are uh, relevant for the HDFS part, for example. Okay? If I want to modify my configuration of HDFS, again, it's something you can do quite easily through the web interface. Most of the time, uh, it's not most of the time actually, it's something that will require to have a restart. So we normally ask you to first stop the services, modify your configuration file, and then restart the services. Okay? So that's the part about how do you manage and how do you configure your, your host. That's a, again the host in a different view. But if I click on one physical host, for example, I also have the performance metric coming out of Ganglia just for this physical host. Before, what we are looking at were the cluster of, of nodes working together. There, we are looking at just the metric on one physical host. But that's all about the, the performance. And there is something else which is available from Ambari, which is uh, the different job which I'm running within my organization. So that's a different MapReduce job which are being run within the organization. So for example, you can see that I've got a job there which is a MapReduce code, I've got a IF script which I've been running, I've got a pig, and so on and so forth. How much data did I took in, how much data did I output it, and so on. Something which is interesting to look at is also the swim lane. Okay, so something I forgot to mention when I spoke about pig and IF is that pig and IF, they are, when you're creating a pig script or when you're writing an IF query, what they're first doing is that they're translating this big script, or they're translating this IF query into effectively some MapReduce job. Okay? So when you look from the name node, you, or sorry, from the job tracker user interface, your big script has become, has become five different uh, MapReduce jobs, so it's sometimes quite hard to track which, what happened over this time. There, what we're representing is that we're representing, uh, I think it was a big script that I've clicked on. We're representing those five, uh, those, those job which have been, sorry, we're representing my big script which has been split into those five jobs. Okay, so we can see that, for example, that was my two uh, map phase, and then I had a, probably a, sh um, a shuffle and then some different uh, radius phase afterwards. Okay, I can have a look at here. But I can also look at where did I spend my time, okay? So that was first the mapping, the shuffling, and then the reduce stuff. It's, it's got all of the history as well. So if you've got a job which, were, which you're running regularly, you can also check that the performance are not being degraded, not, are not degrading, okay? So that you always have the same performance. And to get, you get all of this information directly from this point, effectively, okay? And uh, boom, boom, boom. As, well, see, something, something else that we're going to add is the uh, Hadoop user experience. So I don't know if you're familiar with you. You give you with a small web interface which lets you rag, write pick script, which lets you write, I've, which lets you do quite a lot of things. And uh, with you, it's, it's, uh, it's going to be a new tab that you're going to have available here. And you will be able to effectively have a, you know, an editor to write your pick script with synt syntax highlighting and so on and so forth. Okay, so it makes it fairly easy and straightforward to learn how to, or to write big script at least. There is just maybe one last thing that I would like, if you want to learn a bit more about Hadoop and how to use Hadoop, there is something that Hortonworks does quite well. We've got a sandbox, which is a standalone virtual machine that you can go and download from, uh, from our website. And as part of this sandbox, you've got a standalone uh, Hadoop, cl not cluster because it's a standalone node, but you've got a, an Hadoop environment running and uh, you also have some tutorials. So on the left-hand side, you've got uh, the tutorial where you can, you know, we're telling you what to do with Pig and how to use Pig and how to do use Hive and introducing you to this kind of tools. And on the right, you've got this Hadoop user experience, which lets you do it uh, effectively on the same time. Okay? Do you have any question regarding Ambari or regarding Hadoop effectively? 
Do you use yourself Hadoop, or have you, did any of you started using Hadoop? You do, over there? Yeah, so surprise, surprise. <laughs> no? Any question regarding Hadoop or Ambari or? No. Okay, no questions. Thank you very much. Uh